Welcome to this day of lectures by the 2009-10 Templeton Fellow, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. My name is Robert Neville. Today's lectures mark the conclusion of the public part of the Religious and Psychological Well-Being Project of the Danielson Institute at Boston University. This project has run for nearly three years with generous funding from the Metanexus Institute and the Templeton Foundation. The executive director of the Metanexus Institute, who awarded the original funding and who has visited us twice during the grant period, is with us. And I would like to take this occasion to thank him and his institution. Will Dr. William Grassi please step forward? Sounds like I'm going to give you an honorary degree. I so. will. The public part of the project has consisted of a lecture series for each of three years with a single lecturer contributing six serial lectures and several other lectures uh, speaking on singular topics. In addition, the project has included a research group of scholars from Boston University who have met regularly, giving papers to one another on topics of religious and psychological well-being and learn to collaborate with people from outside their fields. Occasionally, in past semesters, a course has been offered in conjunction with the lecture series of the time. These parts of the project have all been valuable. The series of lectures given by the official Templeton Fellow each year are now coming out in publication. One, Reviving Christian Humanism, New Conversations on Spirituality, Theology, and Psychology by Dr. Don S. Browning is already published by Fortress Press. A second, Religious and Spiritual Experiences, a Multidisciplinary Inquiry into Their Nature, Functions, and Value by Wesley J. Wildman, who's with us today, is in production now at the Cambridge University Press. At the moment, it lacks sufficient existence necessary to wave it about, but that will come. The third volume by Professor Barbara Fredrickson will come from these lectures. So on behalf of all of us at Boston University, let me express our gratitude to Dr. Grassi for his support and for that of the Metanexus Institute that he heads and present him with a copy of Don Browning's book. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and I've uh, followed the activities here at Boston University with great interest. Um, it's very, very uh, difficult and important to do interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work today in the university, work on uh, uh, big questions, important issues, and uh, religion and uh, positive uh, well-being is uh, certainly one of them. As I arrived in Boston yesterday and walked over from Back Bay Station along uh, Newberry Street, I noticed that there was a lot of positive psychology in the air uh, here in Boston. I think that had to do with uh, spring fever and the lovely weather, but it's a, a, a special privilege to be here on such a lovely day, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Fredrickson's uh, comments on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Brian McCorkle from our research group will introduce the speaker and today's sessions. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. Dr. Fredrickson is the Keenan Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she is also the director of the Positive Emotions and Psychophysiology Laboratory. And in addition to psychology, she is adjunct professor of management in the University of North Carolina School of Business, School of, yes, Business. Professor Fredrickson received her BA degree from Carleton College and her PhD in psychology from Stanford University. Before coming to North Carolina, she taught at Duke and the University of Michigan, where she was also a professor of both psychology and business. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Templeton Prize in Positive Psychology from the American Psychological Association. Dr. Fredrickson studies and writes about many things, but primarily positive emotions and gender studies with a deep interest in connections between psychology and physiology. She's a prolific writer, having authored or co-authored over 60 journal articles, 27 book chapters, 17 smaller pieces such as encyclopedia entries and book reviews, 
two editions of an intro psych textbook, currently 13 other publications in various stages of preparation, and last but certainly not least, she's recently published this book, Positivity, in 2009 with Crown Publishers. And the cover features a quote from Martin Seligman, whom many people consider the father of the modern empirical study of positive psychology. He wrote, Barbara Fredrickson is the genius of the positive psychology movement. Well, that's <laughs> hard to receive higher praise from a better source. With a background like that, perhaps it's not surprising that this week alone, she's giving five lectures in three different cities. I first heard her speak at a conference in Denver in the 1990s. She was early on in her work on positive emotions, and I remember thinking she was really onto something. It just made so much sense. And it seems that was true, and it's really been a delight to see how her broaden and build theory of positive emotions has come to shape the thinking of so many different people. But such, such success does take time, and she's asked me to mention that we actually have her on loan from her ever so patient family, seven-year-old Crosby, 10-year-old Garrett, and her husband of many years, Jeff Chapel. Professor Fredrickson's overall theme for her Templeton research lectures is how positivity seeds character development, spiritual transformation, and lifestyle change. She presented three lectures on this topic last month, which were videotaped and will be available online very soon. And today she presents her three final lectures, which are also being videotaped and will be available online. So let me just take a moment to speak about the videotaping. So we are trying to present this wonderful material to a wide audience free of charge. And we ask your cooperation with that. If you could ask all of your questions at that microphone over there, it means it will be picked up and the people who are watching over the internet will actually be able to hear your question, which will make her answer make much more sense. So uh, we ask for your cooperation in helping us make this as good an experience for the viewing public as possible. Thank you. So today, Dr. Fredrickson is presenting her final three lectures. The, at, uh, right now, she's presenting a talk on the dynamics of positive opposites. And then after lunch at 1.30, using positivity to bounce back from inevitable setbacks. And the final lecture of the day at 4 p.m., a blueprint for character development, spiritual transformation, and lifestyle change. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you back to Boston University, Dr. Fredrickson. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's nice to be here again. Uh, today I'll be speaking about some of my work on the dynamics of positive opposites and how positive and negative emotions can work together and also link that to uh, some other work in the field that takes a similar perspective just to see what we can learn from that. And I want to revisit uh, a concept that I raised a month ago when I was here for, and uh, give a little background for those of you who uh, weren't here for those talks. But um, the idea is that like any living thing, all of us can either languish in life, uh, barely holding on to life, or flourish, uh, becoming uh, remarkably uh, uh, alive, resilient to adversity, and um, just growing and thriving. Now, people who flourish are um, not just happy. People who flourish are certainly happier than people who are languishing, um, but being happy is, is really just half of the story. Uh, flourishing individuals are also um, doing good. They're feeling good and doing good is the quick way to say it. They are, see themselves as making a contribution to the world, adding value um, to the communities and, and groups they're part of. And one of the sad facts about uh, flourishing in this country is that epidemiological work suggests that fewer than 20 percent of adults would be classified as flourishing. Uh, many more would be considered happy, but not so many flourishing. And just to recap, some of the benefits that have been linked to flourishing are um, uh, really striking when you consider that um, 
the differences between uh, langu people who are languishing are not physically ill, they're not mentally ill, they're just not flourishing either. So that's the vast majority of individuals who just might feel that their life is uh, kind of stuck in a rut or maybe not going anywhere. And so these comparisons that I'm going to show you are the benefits of flourishing uh, compared to languishing, not compared to people who are mentally ill or physically ill. Um, fewer lost work days. Uh, fewer limitations on daily activities, lower health care utilization, fewer chronic health conditions. So there are a number of benefits that go along with flourishing that really underscore the value of taking a close look at what enables people to flourish. And I've argued that positive emotions, positivity, um, is an active ingredient within human flourishing. That this is the, the main uh, psychological state we need to pay attention to, to understand how to get to that relatively rare state of flourishing. Now, um, that leads to the question of uh, how much positive emotion is enough to seed human flourishing. Uh, from the work that I described um, in my earlier lectures, we know that positive emotions open people's uh, awareness. We know that um, that happens at a quite literal level where people see more of the periphery and are able to take in the big picture. So positive emotions have this opening quality. They also have this transformative quality. They are building our resources for the better. So all of that descriptive work um, we were, uh, that's been carried out in laboratory and field experiments points to the fact that positive emotions are valuable to us. Um, but if you want to take that from uh, a description to a prescription, uh, how much is enough? How, we know positive emotions are useful states. But how do we know when we're um, in the ballpark of getting towards flourishing? I've argued that there's a particular tipping point ratio of people's positive to negative emotions that um, will determine where, people's odds of flourishing that uh, below this tipping point ratio, um, positive emotions are sufficiently rare that downward spirals towards languishing <coughs> and, and mental illness um, really transpire. And above this same tipping point, positive emotions are in sufficient supply to seed human flourishing. So I want to just remind you of a tipping point that you know very well already. Um, and that is the difference between ice and water. Um, and I want to I invite you to just look at these familiar substances um, with new eyes for a moment. Ice and water are just so dramatically different from one another. You have something solid, rigid, I immobile uh, in ice and in water, something flexible, flowing, something that's really moving. And uh, at one level, they seem so un uh, dissimilar. And yet, to change one into the other, all you need to do is raise the ambient temperature. Okay? The difference between languishing and flourishing may be similar. That, uh, w w that stuck feeling of, of languishing is like being in that ice block. And um, we may be able to warm up people's positivity ratio, warm up the emotional tone of their lives to change people from that that uh, rigid ice block of languishing into the flowing, more flexible, dynamic life of flourishing. So the zero degrees Celsius is that magic tipping point in thermodynamics. Um, what I'm arguing is that there's a similar tipping point in people's emotion, in human psychology, uh, a particular ratio of positive to negative emotions that describes the place where people are much more likely to be in the situation of flourishing in life. And uh, so you, I, I think of um, 
the connection here as it's, it's, a, it's a bold claim because people don't make claims about psychology that says there is a number like, uh, like zero degrees Celsius that changes the state of things. But I think there's reason to begin asking whether there are some properties of human psychology that operate based on simple laws like that, that, that are perhaps not easy to see because emotions the metric in which that works is emotions, and we often haven't been looking at dividing up human experiences in terms of their emotional tone. But it's possible that we have uh, just as sharp of a tipping point um, as in thermodynamics within human psychology. And I want to um, uh, say a bit more about the origins of the tipping point idea, and it really started with my collaboration with Marcel Losada. Um, and he had, in the 90s, done well, some research on business teams and reworked his data for uh, several years after that. And in um, oh, about uh, a number of years ago, about 2003, he called me up out of the blue, um, well, sent me an email out of the blue, uh, he said he'd had a mathematical model of my broaden and build theory. And actually, um, his call came right after my second son was born, so I wasn't really uh, able to um, just dive right into it, but he was persistent. Um, a few months later, he wrote back, did you get my email? I have this mathematical model of your, of your theory. We should talk. And it turns out he was in Ann Arbor at the time, which is my hometown. And so we got together, and he shared with me what he had been finding by creating mathematical models of behavioral data he'd gathered on business teams for uh, a decade or more. And uh, I want to describe to you his early work because it sets up uh, some of the work that we did together. What he did was observe over 60 business teams as they were carrying out their uh, you know, ordinary activities. So these were not teams formed for the sake of a laboratory study, but they were existing business teams. Based on independent data after the fact, he divided these 60 teams into high performing, medium performing, and low performing teams. The basis for this division was um, based on uh, their customer satisfaction scores, their uh, 360 reviews within the organization and um, their uh, financial success. Okay, so there were uh, three objective indicators of who was doing well and who wasn't doing well. And if teams were um, viewed as doing really well on all three of those metrics, they were judged to be the high performing teams. If they were doing poorly on all three of those metrics, they were the low performing teams. And as you can see, the most typical team had mixed success. They were um, good on some indices, poor on, poor on others. Those are the medium performance teams. And what Losada did was have train a crew of research assistants to observe these uh, business teams in real time. He actually had them in a, a laboratory room that was set up just like a conference room, but it had one-way mirrors around the edges. So there was a, a legion of coders behind them, behind the one-way mirrors, making um, uh, judgments about every utterance that was said. And so these coders coded every speech act, every every um, utterance, as either positive or negative, as either inquiry or advocacy, and as either focusing on the self or other. Positive or negative, um, positive was um, offering encouragement, um, excitement, um, appreciation. Negative was being sarcastic, um, critical, um, dismissive. Inquiry, asking questions. Advocacy, making your own point ever stronger. <laughs> so, um, uh, and the distinction between self and other was really, the self here was referring to the speaker or the group present, and other was anybody outside the group. Okay, So all of these acts could be um, coded as, as either of these or as neither. And looking at 
these, these business team meetings lasted about an hour or so, looking at the patterns of those codes over the time of the meetings. What he did offline over the next several years was create a nonlinear dynamics model of the observed connections between these variables, the lead lag relationships and their patterns over time. And what I'm gonna show you here is two of Losada's variables, the emotion codes, positive or negative, and inquiry advocacy. And for those of you familiar with um, chaos and nonlinear dynamics, you'll recognize the green structure here as the famous butterfly-shaped attractor from the Lorenz system, which was first uh, used to, uh, it's often described as the beginning of our understanding of um, complexity, uh, and was used to do understand the um, complex uh, dynamics behind weather forecasting. The green structure here actually represents the dynamics underlying the <coughs> behavior that Losada observed in the high performing teams, the teams that were doing extraordinarily well. Um, there, they had the highest ratio of positive to negative emotions. Um, this emotional space can be um, uh, directly converted to the ratio of positive to negative emotions and they had the highest ratio at about uh, six to one. They had the broadest range of inquiry to advocacy. So they were, they were <coughs> asking the most questions and advocating their points of view. They had the broadest range of that. And um, the blue structure in the middle actually represents the dynamics of the medium performance teams. They start out with the same butterfly-shaped pattern here except at a lower um, positivity ratio. Their positivity ratio was about a little, o little over, just under two to one. And they have a narrower range of inquiry and advocacy. And um, I, I wish I had this graph to build dynamically, but one thing that you see here is that um, uh, it actually, they don't keep this butterfly-shaped structure. After a moment, the model suggests that after a moment of extreme negativity, they kick into this uh, limit cycle in one of the wings, and eventually they have the structure of a limit cycle, which literally could be described as stuck in a rut. It just keeps retracing the same area. So they don't have the same resilience as the high-performing teams, which can um, absorb negativity and still keep their flexibility. They can bounce back. The red here represents the dynamics um, underlying the performance of the low performing teams. They had um, the lowest positivity ratio and um, very little inquiry. Um, their ratio of positivity to negativity was uh, something uh, less than one to one. And uh, the way you can think of these meetings as um, there's very little positivity, lots of criticism, no questioning, no focus on outside. So it's basically one of those meetings that I'm sure we've all experienced where people are just waiting to talk. Nobody's listening, nobody's asking questions, exploring, just waiting to get on their soapbox and say what they should do, okay? I think we can all recognize meetings like that. Um, so the difference, uh, between these, this, the differential structure between these different uh, business teams um, was very exciting for me to learn about because to me they paralleled what I had been finding how positivity and resilience and creativity were going together. So a lot of the same things that he was finding in his mathematical modeling of, of business team behavior was uh, forming a really nice parallel to the work I had um, done on positive emotions broadening the behavioral repertoire. You see that with a broader inquiry, um, more openness, more resilience. And although that's not represented here, there was another facet of um, the high-performing business teams. They had more social connectivity. There was more, 
in a way, attunement between how people in the room um, responded to one another, uh, whereas there was less so in the uh, low performing teams. So in a way, that social attunement, like if, um, if I offer one question, someone builds on it, and, and there's a constructive way of building upon it, this connectivity, that um, I, I view as a, uh, one way to look at a social resource. So that group was acting as, as um, more than the sum of its parts. Now, hours into our conversation about this, I mean, this was uh, an afternoon um, I spent with Lasada, and he was um, sharing with me his work. An hour or hours into this conversation, he made the bold claim that he could locate the exact positivity ratio that would distinguish between these medium performance teams and the, the green high performance teams. Basically, what would be the bifurcation point or the tipping point that would be the doorway to flourishing. And uh, this was possible to do because Losada's mathematical model fell into the category of the, of a, in the family of the Lorenz system. Okay, that, um, I think Losada told me at first he was a little disappointed with that because he wanted to invent something new that would be the Losada system. Um, but it, you know, when he uh, uh, looked at the dynamics, it was part of a famous form, uh, the Lorenz system. That turned out to be hugely fortuitous because that the Lorenz system is something that's been studied um, for decades in an, you know, and so there's a mountain of mathematical and physic, uh, physics work done on this system. And from that mountain of work, we could make some, um, uh, we could stand on the shoulders of, of that, those giants who had uh, done this work before. There's a pr particular uh, number, the control parameter that had been identified in the Lorenz system that served as the bifurcation point or the tipping point um, to be the entryway into the um, complex dynamics, the chaotic dynamics of the um, high performing teams. The, there was an exact parallel between uh, Losada's algebraic phrases and the Lorenz system that allowed us to translate the control parameter into um, the ratio of positive to negative emotions. So um, if you're interested in the mathematics of that, I have it um, tucked into the footnotes of my book. Uh, my <coughs> editors would not let me put it in the text. Um, but I, I thought, you know, there's going to be some people who really want to connect the dots and see how this works. So I wanted to create a little trail <laughs> for that. Um, so if you follow the notes or go back to the original articles, um, you can certainly find it, um, how those equations map together. But anyway, for, for now, I'll say there is a, a set of equations that would make the translation between the classic Lorenz system and Losada's um, equations um, mere algebra. And so we could find the equivalent of, of uh, the Raleigh number. This, um, the ratio that made the difference was essentially three to one. Okay. In fairness to Losada, I should say that he would prefer to say that it was 2.901 to one, um, that in uh, nonlinear dynamics like this, the, the small decimals matter quite a bit. But I think in terms of uh, practically thinking about using this as a, a guideline for how to live life, I think three to one is precise enough. Um, so. Uh, I like to say three to one. So the conclusion that, Los, or the claim that Losada made was that uh, when positivity ratios are above three to one, these flourishing dynamics should emerge. When they're below three to one, they should not be evident. Um, and that was certainly true descriptively in his work. He found that the high performing teams were at six to one and the medium performing teams were just under two to one. So they were on either side of three to one, three to one being the tipping point. And so I, I said, you know, I think I have some data that I could test that idea against. And it turns out I had two separate data sets where I had measured um, 
flourishing mental health and through an independent measure. This was something that has been developed by Corey Keyes. It's a self-report measure, in his words, used to diagnose um, flourishing, very much like you would diagnose depression. Uh, and so we could classify people as either flourishing or not uh, by their scores on this test. And again, keep in mind that flourishing is relatively rare. So um, it's not surprising to know that there's uh, uh, smaller subsets of those who flourish than those who languish. And then I also had these same people in a study where they were reporting on their emotions at the end of every day for uh, 28 days. And from that, I had people, or I, I was able to compute after the fact their ratio of positive emotions to negative emotions over the whole month. I looked at not their ratio within a day, but their ratio over the month, um, uh, tallying up all the positive emotions they experienced over 28 days and putting that over all the negative emotions they experienced over 28 days. There's a couple important reasons to do it over time. One is that it is possible for people to have a day where they're not experiencing any potent negative emotions, and then you cannot com compute a ratio. So, but it's, uh, I didn't have any people who had no negative emotions in a month, um, and so that makes it uh, more feasible. <clears throat> so, and across two different data sets, I, th this is plotting um, one set of data, but this, the second set is very similar. Um, here I have presented what um, the ratio that we found for individuals who could be classified as flourishing, their ratio was 3.2 to 1 of positive to negative emotions over the course of a month. Those who were uh, diagnosed as not flourishing, what you might call languishing, were at uh, 2.3 to 1. And essentially in an independent sample we got almost the same uh, uh, ratios there. Now, uh, in, in submitting this for publication, we also needed to say that, well, it's not just that these were on either side of three to one. We also did traditional linear statistics and showed that they were significantly different from one another. So that's also true, even though they're close to one another. They are statistically uh, different in traditional linear terms, but that doesn't, um, it's the flanking the three to one line, which is the thing that supports the idea of the tipping point. What I have plotted on the uh, right side for you is uh, Lasada's business teams. His high-performing business teams were just under six to one, um, the, the ones that I would call flourishing business teams. The ones who were um, struggling, low-performing teams were well under one to one. And in the middle, I've uh, plotted data from John Gottman's research. You may uh, be aware of his work. He's one of the leading scientists who studied uh, marriage, what, make, what makes marriage work, and he has found in, in, in a number of studies by observing couples uh, who are both satisfied and dissatisfied with their marriage talk about uh, difficult topics in their marriage and use different, two different coding systems, some based on nonverbal, just nonverbal cues, and others based on verbal and nonverbal cues. But he's basically come to the conclusion that marriages that are satisfying and that last, so I think that's reasonable to call them flourishing marriages, are at uh, a ratio of five to one, positive to negative emotions, whereas marriages that are, in his words, on a cascade towards divorce, um, unsatisfying marriages, are uh, at a ratio of less, just under one to one. And that, that was all of the marriages that he's, there wasn't a, a middle group in between, so it seemed to really float into five to one and one to one. So the degree of commonality across all these uh, data sets is what's especially striking to me is that um, my work with individuals uh, had people's self-reports of emotions. Gottman's work with uh, married couples had observers' ratings of emotions, and uh, including verbal and nonverbal. Um, Losada's business teams were observers' views of business teams, just verbal coding, not nonverbal coding. But we had very different ways of measuring emotions. 
um, different levels of analysis from individuals to um, dyads to teams. And across all of these, we find that the individuals, marriages, and teams that are doing extraordinarily well all have ratios of positivity to negativity above the three to one tipping point, whereas the others don't. If you're doing badly, they're um, lower than that. What I think is uh, an insight that I had based on this idea that the three to one may be this critical tipping point above which people flourish, below which people don't, is that it could explain this uh, vexing problem in the study of the effects of positive emotions, which is that these effects are very subtle and sometimes you don't see them at all. And that's, um, that can be extraordinarily frustrating when you're trying to you know, put out evidence that yes, positive emotions are useful. And, um, but a lot of times people's own experience would say, no, they're not, they're trivial, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have any effect at all. So the three to one ratio may provide some insight into that, that perhaps positive emotions only are um, uh, psychoactive if you're above this three to one ratio. They may indeed be completely inert when they are swamped by negativity. And this uh, also helps make sense of two really important asymmetries between positive and negative emotions. One it, we know very well as uh, negativity bias, or bad is stronger than good. Negative events and emotions really grab our attention and absorb our, our minds and, um, and just swamp, uh, swamp out and dilute um, our positive experiences. But uh, um, a lesser known asymmetry is the positivity offset, that most moments are positive. Um, but again, this, the ratio I th helps me make sense of this idea of that sometimes the effects of positive emotions are very difficult to locate. So I went back to some other uh, data that I had on hand to see if I could test this now you see it, now you don't idea, that, that positive emotions are basically inert um, if they're under the three to one ratio. And what I did here was basically the opposite of what I'd done in the data that I showed you just a moment ago. Um, in, in these studies, what I did was classify people as flourishing and then look at their ratio. And in the studies I'm gonna show you next, I, I calculated their ratio and divided people by whether their ratio was above three to one and below three to one and looked at evidence of whether we saw the, the classic effects of positive emotions that my lab is known for. Do positive emotions broaden and do they build? Okay. So the first thing uh, came from a data set that um, we, uh, this is a finding that was published uh, a number of years ago by Christian Waugh. And what we looked at was this measure of broadening and found that the, the measure of, of broadening we looked at was, um, this was a data set where we had uh, freshman college students, uh, their ratings of their new roommate freshman year, someone they didn't know at all before the semester started, and then we got their ratings of them over the course of a month. And we found that over the course of the month, um, for some, they showed more and more self-other overlap or more and more um, uh, ability to, to um, uh, see how they and their roommates were similar. And then we had a separate index of complex understanding. Basically, do people show the same patterns of interpretation of their friend's behavior as they would of their own behavior, which is not reifying them in terms of traits, but then seeing them, well, you know, whether they're outgoing or, or shy really depends on the situation. Okay, that's, that's an index of the complex understanding. And for both of those measures, it was only the people who had positivity ratios above three to one who showed indices of broadening. Um, those uh, lower, basically, again, positive emotions were inert. So that um, fits exactly with the now you see it, now you don't model, that positive emotions did not become active ingredients in broadening unless they were in a context in which um, uh, negative emotions were relatively rare. 
We had a similar way of looking at this in terms of positivity building resilience, trait resilience over the course of a month. Um, again, this is from a data set I'll show you uh, more about in the first lecture this afternoon. But basically, if we look at those in whom over the course of the month they show growth in resilience, it was really only those who were above three to one who showed that growth. So again, both of these data sets support the idea that um, positive emotions are, are sources of growth and change, but only in certain contexts. Okay, so what happens at higher levels of positive affect? Um, oops. The, uh, the, the beauty of having a mathematical model underlying this work is that you can ask questions about what would happen if people only experienced positive emotions and never experienced negative emotions. Is that an ideal we should be shooting for? Um, this is, you don't have to find that uh, one in a million person or culture that experiences no negativity in order to test this. You could run the mathematical model and see what happens. And so that's uh, what Lasada and I did uh, in an earlier paper. And what we found is that um, that complex dynamics of the flourishing uh, shown in the green here uh, completely devolves this is illustrated at 100 to 1, just really trying to use a ratio that suggests virtually no negativity, devolves into a particular t form of a limit cycle. I think it's kind of interesting that it looks like a uh, twisted clown smile. Um, I call that the Pollyanna plot. That's the I experience no negative emotions smile. Um, the, uh, now this tipping point, the 3 to 1 tipping point has been tested against real life data. This tipping point has not, so I'm much more cautious in how I interpret this one. And yet, I think the, the lesson that you can pull from it is that human flourishing also depends on negative emotions. Negative emotions are vital. We cannot, um, uh, uh, we shouldn't be striving for an ideal that has uh, no negative emotions. Or as one of my colleagues likes to put it, the ratio is three to one, not three to zero. Um, that it's very, uh, what I like about that is that's a wide enough prescription that there's no negative emotion or no emotion at all that we need to banish from our existence in order to flourish. Um, it's just a matter of keeping them in perspective. Uh, I actually um, think a sailboat metaphor fits here really well. And that is, you know, rising from the sailboat is the mast that carries the sail that allows you to catch the wind. Below the waterline is the keel, which can weigh tons. You can take the mast going up as positivity, the keel down below as negativity. Um, and if you sail, you know that even though it's the, uh, the sail hanging on the mast that allows you to catch the wind and, and uh, powers the boat, you can't sail without the keel. Um, you'd uh, just slide across the water or turtle the boat. Uh, and especially, you can't sail upwind without the keel. Because um, when we're facing difficulty, if you want to take that as upwind, it's, that's when it's especially important to balance our positivity with an earnest, honest negativity. Um, then, in a way, we need the levity of positivity to counterweight the gravity of, of negativity, but together they produce a dynamic that, that really fuels flourishing. I want to uh, say a word or two about negativity and flourishing and um, uh, make a distinction between what I call appropriate and gratuitous negativity. So if, uh, if we if a ratio of, of positivity to negativity above three to one is useful, the nice thing about a ratio is it, it gives you um, three different ways of raising the ratio. You can raise the ratio by increasing the numerator, decreasing the denominator, or both. Okay, and so sometimes um, the most appropriate thing to do is to work on negativity. Um, 
in the denominator. And there, I think it's very important to see the difference and recognize the difference between appropriate negativity and gratuitous negativity. And I, I build on John Gottman's work here quite a bit. And um, what he has argued for a number of years is that anger in marriages can be very constructive and that people, couples can learn a lot by um, uh, addressing anger. And then there are other negative emotions like contempt and disgust that are just much more corrosive in marriages. And indeed, he's found that um, a best predictor of, of uh, whether a couple will get divorced is whether he can see a glimmer of disgust on the wife's face. Um, that's you know, usually the first uh, sign that it's going nowhere after that. Um, it's interpersonally a very toxic emotion. It's like, I don't even want to be around you. Whereas anger says, I'm not getting what I need. Let's work through this. Okay, so the messages of those emotions are very different. Similar, you can make a similar distinction between shame and guilt. Um, guilt is uh, the emotion that you feel when you do wrong and you, um, you think it's solvable. You can make amends, make an apology, ask for forgiveness. Um, you, you see something of your behavior is wrong. Okay, shame is very similar except people take that same mistake and think they as a human is wrong, is wrong. You're totally wrong as a person. You just want to shrink into, you know, disappear into the floorboards and, and die. You know, that, that there's, it's, um, it's not directly solvable in the same way guilt is. Um, so one way to distinguish between appropriate negativity and gratuitous negativity, appropriate negativity is very connected to the nuances of the situation and can be addressed. Um, and there's a way to, to move past it easily. Gratuitous negativity is often um, overblown. It's not really exactly connected to the circumstances and isn't exactly solvable. Um, you can think of uh, just worry versus uh, ordinary anxiety um, as a difference. Worry is obsessive. It becomes unconnected to the exact situation that you're in. So um, here's, a, here's a quote that I think reflects this buoyancy of, of, of positivity um, as uh, the counterweight to the gravity of negativity. People think angels fly because they have wings. Angels fly because they take themselves lightly. Um, I don't get weighted down in that gratuitous negativity. So again, just to uh, summarize what I've argued here, how much is enough? How much positivity is, is, does it take to reach flourishing? I've argued that a positivity ratio of three to one is what's uh, necessary here. And the graphic I found didn't have enough pebbles on the one side. So um, that positivity ratios above three to one are the doorway to flourishing. That um, uh, ratios above 11 to one could perhaps be too much positivity. Um, and uh, keep us ungrounded. Now I want to turn uh, to uh, just discussing briefly an idea about how this connects to the practice of um, loving kindness meditation, which is something that I spent some time talking about in an earlier lecture. And that is that um, we can think of bringing uh, the negative and positive together and experiencing them in a ratio, not just exclusive positivity or uh, exclusive negativity. Um, one of the things that I've mentioned that I'll discuss more in the next lecture is how we've learned from resilient people is that they experience their positive and negative emotions side by side. And then I think that there is a, a really important role for the awareness of suffering, uh, the awareness of um, of uh, ills in the world that can very much enable our compassion and love to take off and have more of an effect. Um, that if we uh, aim to cultivate uh, loving kindness or positive experiences, self-generate those, it's actually also helpful to be at the same time aware of suffering, not to be um, 
weighed down or, or uh, as uh, Sharon Salzberg describes it, kind of shattered by the suffering, not so much that you're making it your own suffering, but that we're aware of suffering in the world in a way that gives the, the, um, the self-generating of positive emotions some traction and allows it to really take off. Because sometimes if we just generate um, or focus on self-generating positive emotions without, by, by turning away from the suffering, we could actually be um, stripping the positive emotions from their, from their real energy of um, pushing us forward. And being able to hold the two side by side um, with an appreciation that, you know, uh, we don't have control over what suffering happens in the world and, and how long our, our positive experiences would last um, is, fits my growing understanding of the concept of equanimity that we're, um, that we're able to recognize these facets of human experiences and uh, <coughs> not um, push them out of conscious awareness or pretend they don't exist and also move forward with hope. So I think that that concept of equanimity can sit well with the notion that positive and negative emotions need to uh, operate in a dynamic. Um, I also want to draw a connection to a colleague of mine's work, uh, Robert Quinn, um, who really looks at the dynamic of positive opposites in his work on authentic leadership, or, or um, actually, he calls it the fundamental state of leadership, uh, this uh, leadership that any of us, regardless of our title, can have. When is it that we are inspiring to others? And the basic logic here is that you know, we have all these either or concepts, and what we really need is to melt them into both and. Um, and so I, I use the rabbit duck uh, illusion here, and then I realize, well, that actually flips from either or, that maybe that's not the best melting into both and. Um, at one level, it's both and, but usually you see it as one or the other. So maybe it's not the best uh, visual for this. Um, but I just want to point out the way that Bob Quinn in his work has integrated positive opposites and then make a connection back to uh, emotions. Uh, you know, again, if we take a, a reified trait view of people, we might say, well, some people are spontaneous and others are self-disciplined. But really, we're, you know, it's perhaps better to be both, and it, sometimes in equal measure, sometimes at the same time. A both-and perspective, he argues, is uh, responsible freedom. Um, compassionate to others, thoughtful about others, or assertive, taking a stand. If you put those together, he calls it tough love. Factual, being really grounded or hopeful, thinking about the future in a, in a it could be a different, the future could be different. Um, the both and view of that he would call grounded vision, a realistic vision. Confident, uh, you know, being very self-assured of you know the right answer versus flexible, discovering it along the way. Uh, what Bob Quinn would call those in a both and form is adaptive confidence. And this is my addition to this, uh, positive emotions or negative emotions. Um, if you integrate those and really put them into, uh, uh, you'd see you're emotionally attuned. And this is what we find, again, um, and I'll go into this more in this afternoon's first lecture, is that resilient people are really emotionally nimble. They're not you know, constantly putting out positive emotions. They're able to uh, recognize when it is appropriate to uh, feel negative emotions. And they're not papering over them, but co-experiencing them. So I think that's an emotional nimbleness or attunement that um, is a, a very important form of flexibility of opposites to pay attention to. So again, um, I think in uh, many Western views, we think of positive emotions and negative emotions as things that are opposite and distinct from one another, that if you're feeling one, you're not, not at all feeling the other. And I, I, I think that's a view that we need to really challenge and understand how to integrate those. Um, just real briefly, this also connects really well with some work by Csikszentmihalyi and Kevin Rothundi on the dialectics of creativity, 
where they argue that um, from interviewing eminent um, historians, artists, and such about how it is that they're able to produce the work that they've produced. Um, they've got this um, uh, a long series of interviews with really famous um, uh, eminent scholars and artists. And what they find is that um, there's very much uh, a way in which two opposing modes are worked with uh, together so that um, uh, how Rathunde describes it is that these, these uh, really creative people make experiential course corrections to kind of weave in and out of an intuitive mode and a rational mode. An intuitive mode of being more open, maybe taking time in nature, um, you know, having insights just uh, come to you, being more playful, kind of like the, uh, the looser side of creativity and the rational mode, you know, kind of being the hard scientist, being very critical, always working at your desk or in a lab, you know, finding problems everywhere you look, um, uh, being competitive more than playful. Now those could be described as sort of like, well, some people are more intuitive in their approach, others are, are more rational in their approach to their work, uh, but what they're just finding with uh, really um, eminent scholars is that they have a, a very attuned way of working with, I'm getting a little too much in this way, let me make a course correction here, okay? So again, um, what seems to be is that navigating back and forth within these seems to be uh, the vital um, description of creativity. Again, I think that has to do with this uh, kind of co-experiencing <laughs> positive opposites. Um, and I think it also helps us understand the importance of taking breaks um, and just having that downtime as, as the place when things, ideas can consolidate. We often don't think of this as work, but that's work just as much as the pushing the pencil or tapping on your keyboard is work. Okay, um, what I think I'll do is just point out that um, one of the things that I developed to go along with my uh, book, Positivity, is a website that allows people to capture their own positivity ratios. Um, so this is uh, just a little shot of the web page. Uh, what's your ratio? 80% of Americans fall short of the three to one ideal. Um, take this two minute test. So anyway, you can go to the website, positivityratio.com, as a quick and dirty way to get at um, uh, what's your ratio is for the day. Now scientifically I don't think a day's ratio is what you should be looking at, but um, this is sort of a gee whiz curiosity factor that kind of can go with it. I think you, the best way to calculate the ratio, and I have this described on the website, is to take this short test at the end of the day for a couple of weeks and then you can get a sense of what your ratio is with a little more certainty. Um, with the caveat that our, our measures of emotions are uh, only as good as your honesty and reporting your emotions. So um, that's, that's totally, it. their integrity is really up to the user. So, but I thank you for your attention today. I'd be happy to take any questions. So this is the microphone to come to if you have a question. Um, I'm, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I work with a program in a chronically underperforming school, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're there with some of our graduate students. And um, I'm just struck by the this idea of you were mentioned the word swamped. You know, people who are swamped by negative emotions, and uh, I guess my question, one of my questions, would be. Uh, when we're uh, trying to teach young people how to um, be positive themselves and to interpret the world positively, um, obviously we can try to model that for them, but mm -hmm. how do you uh, see the, those conditions uh, as you know, a limiting factor in, in getting the kids to experience those positive emotions and build those you know, the strength to fortify themselves to deal with all the stuff right. that they have. Right. Um, really dire conditions like that can um, 
uh, set up some special challenges, I can imagine. But I think the, um, one of the messages that I, that I think is really important to um, help people understand is that our, our emotions um, don't just rain down on us like the weather. It's not just that situations automatically create our emotions. Um, situations have a, a big effect on, on our emotions, but um, what sits in between circumstances and, and how one feels is how people are interpreting the situation. And that's the place where you can kind of get some leverage on helping people understand, helping kids understand how the sense they make of their circumstances will um, shape how they feel. And then that sense they make of their circumstances w can shape their, their path for the next month and the year. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that sense making that is the root of uh, of emotions um, is uh, something that we have more control over than we think. So um, uh, helping kids understand um, different ways of finding meaning in, well, why is it that our um, you know, school is this way or somebody is treating me this way? Do you know what I mean? Having people, having, helping kids um, make that reframing or a way to see it in its broader perspective. And then to find ways to um, uh, self-generate um, a sense of safety. That, um, uh, that's where I think meditation practices or just relaxation practices, you don't necessarily need to call them that. You know, just you know, sl slow down breathing exercises or ways that kids can begin to learn that it's up to me how I feel, um, you know, and that they can have some tools for um, getting that a little more under control. But I think looking at the, the leverage points of ref reframing and then taking breaks and, and um, finding moments to sort of get regrounded and get my head back on and less reactive. Because I think a lot of times um, pe when people think of emotions as just like the weather, they don't see their own agency in them. And I think that's our challenge. If I could ask uh, a follow-up to that is, um, I actually think the kids do respond to some of those kinds of reframing things well. Um, I guess uh, uh, my I guess the more intractable problem is working with the adults that work with the kids uh, in the school uh, right. in a systemic. You know, they're kind of right. weighed down by the. Uh, systemic right. problems that they encounter, how would you imagine we could work with that group right. to, maybe, this, maybe it's the same answer, but. Yeah, I think at, at every level, again, um, if the teachers and the administrators are uh, stressed and depleted, it's gonna be hard for them to either model or teach these uh, to kids, so intervening at that level is really critical. I know that um, as part of a positive education initiative, that a big piece of it is going first to the t faculty and staff and um, uh, recognizing that they need um, time and resources to be able to self-generate their own positivity to give to the class. So I think it really can start there. So. Thank you. Good point. Um, the work on the three to one ratio and, and other work, uh, I understand, counts the number of occurrences of positive emotions versus negative emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering to what extent the intensity of those emotions would play a part, I would imagine, a large part, mm -hmm. and also the duration that those emotions lasted. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, do you think that uh, has work been done in that area, and do you think that might affect the ratio outcome? Right. That's, those are really good questions. I feel like the ways that we measure the positivity ratio right now is definitely um, an approximation based on um, sort of uh, uh, some practical choices, like measuring at the end of every day. Um, that the downsides of that is that it, it has people recall 
how much have you felt over the course of the day, and it's very easy to sometimes forget some of the highs and lows, and there's real personality differences in what kinds of things you'll forget. <laughs> and um, so it it's definitely has um, uh, some sources of error in it. I work with the intensity differences within this particular um, metric by uh, this, uh, the way to deal with the negativity bias and positivity offset is that um, if you even, the, the, the score, let me just show you this next. The, the scaling that I've used for this goes from zero to four, not at all to extremely. And to count as a negative emotion, if people say they feel even a little bit of disgust, it increases their tally of negative emotions or a little bit of anger, okay? But when it comes to the positive emotions, the threshold is higher. That if people say they feel a little bit of gratitude, it actually doesn't count. It has to be at least moderately or quite a bit or extremely. And that is to account for that asymmetry between positive emotions and negative emotions. Now, one way to think about it is that, just um, going back to the example of uh, 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 intimate relations, if you, um, intimate relationships, if you feel a little bit of disgust towards your partner, that probably is very psychologically important. Whereas if you just feel a little bit of gratitude towards them, it's pretty much nothing. <laughs> so there's, there's different thresholds to be used there. And that is a, 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 a gross approximation to try to deal with those asymmetries of when it is a negative emotion becomes um, psychologically meaningful and when a positive emotion. So we try to deal with that part. We haven't been able to deal with so well with the duration differences or the repeated experiences within a day with this measure. We've also done a lot of work with uh, uh, what's called the day reconstruction method, which has, takes about an hour for people to, to basically do an archeological dig through an entire day, rating the emotions in each episode. And there we can kind of take into account duration a bit better. Um, but uh, you point out some important aspects of measurement. Again, I think the ratio is especially important um, for helping us understand that positive and negative emotions are not equal opposites to one another. When they're in a one-to-one -one ratio, we see time and again that pathology prevails. There's sort of a rigid pathology where the neg negative emotions always trump positive emotions when they're in equal amounts. The, I think the most important lessons from the ratio is that we need more positive emotions, appreciably more than two to one, because that seems to be sort of the normal place most people are at. Um, uh, three to one and higher seems to describe flourishing, but that we need something um, uh, appreciably higher than one to one, but not no negativity. So there's sort of broader lessons within that ratio pattern um, that allow us to use these more approximate measures and get there. So we don't have laser sharp measures to really, this is why mm -hmm. 2.901 is absurd, is, is not a, a, a thing to be tested when you go to the empirical level because our, our measures need refinement. This uh, scale here, that's the new work or was that part of the three to one measure? That this, was part of the, this is based on the same measure that was used. Um, for the three to one. Yeah. Right. Also when I was, just a side comment or brief comment, when you had that scale of individuals, marriages and mm -hmm. business teams, it seems like as you move to the right to marriages yes. and business teams, uh, you have greater potential for highs and lows. Right. So it just reminds me of the stock market. You take greater risk and you could benefit more or lose more. Well, that's interesting. That's a nice uh, uh, way to look at it. The, the, um, another, there are a couple things that keep me from interpreting that spread. And one is that, uh, well, not only, I mean, I think the, the, the Typical way people understand that is like, oh, well, with larger group sizes, you have a more extreme ratios. But another difference between the way positive emotions were measured in those three different uh, lines of work was that um, I had people reporting their emotions. Um, and the, others, the other two were basically based on observations. So it could be an utterances, what is said. It could be that, um, 
loosely speaking, you need to say um, five to one in order for maybe three to one to stick, <laughs> you know, to actually be felt. And so it's the difference between what's felt and what's said is there's not a one-to-one -one mapping there. So it could be that um, in your marriage it's, it's important to, to, to say things at that level and, and hope that some of them make your partner feel good <laughs> so, or make you feel good or reflect your own good feelings. Just pure speculation, it would be nice if the uh, lower uh, extremes of that graph if there were techniques that could, could, could uh, moderate that lower extreme while leaving the higher uh, extreme intact. Oh, um, to, to raise the ratio for those groups, or uh, what do you mm, mean? I believe it was, the, yeah, basically the lower end, mm -hmm. because you're looking, you're looking at the variance. Right. And the question is, is it just a variance, or can you moderate? Uh, the, the degree of bad feeling that arises or negativity that arises when you're, when you're moving downward. Right, yeah. right. Techniques, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. I appreciate your work. This thank is you. really a, an important work. Um, I'm wondering about the, uh, uh, and appreciate particularly the work you've done with the, uh, the love and kindness, but I'm wondering where, where you're looking at uh, neutral mood states. Uh -huh. and, and, and how, how you're factoring that into your considerations and, right. and, and going with that. Yeah, I'm, um, neutral mood states are, are um, kind of a, a vexing issue for, for my, when I have my scientist hat on, because that's the important comparison group. And one of the things that we learn is that it's easy to elicit positive emotions in the lab and negative emotions in the lab, it's very hard to get neutral exactly right. And that <clears throat> makes me suspicious that perhaps there really is no neutral state, that we're either feeling mildly positive or mildly negative. And that's the best that we can do in our experiments is to get something. The, the more rigorous test in my work is to just have uh, something clearly positive and have the neutral be mildly positive. And a lot of the things that had been used for, for new, neutral comparisons in the past indeed were positive. Things like um, uh, serene nature videos and, and things like that were, were dubbed as neutral. Um, and so uh, I'm, I think if we look closely at what appears to be neutral, we might discover that it's um, uh, a source of mild positivity. And this is why I think, and I'll, I'll present this later today, that one of the um, best approaches for raising genuine positive emotions is to, to be open to the present and really kind of see this, the subtle sources of goodness that, that are around us. Um, but that's my take on, on neutrality. You might have a different take. So uh, what were you? I, I, ha I haven't formed my take on it yet. Uh -huh. but, uh, um, and I guess the following question is, is in measurement issues, in terms of the mechanisms involved in, in cultivating uh, positivity and, and or being able to apprehend those. Right. Are, are you looking at attention in, in, in your lab and looking at how that plays a role in, in being able to, to uh, uh, lay down that memory of, of uh, positivity versus, versus negativity? We obviously right. know the right. arousal of the negative is right. generally lays down that stronger. So is, is your lab involved in looking at mechanisms as well? Um, we're very interested in looking at the mechanisms of uh, positive emotions effects over time. And uh, one of the things that I aim to get at and have been working on for some time is that when we show that positive emotions through the uh, loving kindness meditation, which teaches people how to self-generate positive emotions, leads to the building of resources. Uh, we're tr the holy grail in our lab is to link that to momentary broadened attention, broadened awareness. Um, but we haven't yet had adequate uh, measures of cognitive broadening that we can bring into, uh, that we can um, have people complete on a daily basis 
over time. Most of our best measures of broadening are in the laboratory with cognitive tests of, you know, even um, eye gaze and, you know, they're, they're things that are not easy to um, make portable and make uh, part of a daily experience uh, sampling study or um, I think that people can't self-report adequately on whether my attention was broadened. You know, so we need to get at it behaviorally. So, and that's been a real challenge to find a way to do that in the same size and shape as emotions, which is sort of in, in, in moments and, and days. You're, you're, you're using emotions in, as uh, I would use affective yes. states. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I recognize so. I'm probably standing in the way of, of having coffee. So okay. if there's more conversation, thank okay. you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you again for a wonderful morning. And we invite you all to come back this afternoon for the next talk at 1.30 and the final talk at 4 p.m. Thank you.